Welcome to this webinar focusing on the use of Design Builder's optimization tools for advanced cost benefit analysis. I'm Dave Cocking, and joining me today to present his ground source heat pump optimization work will be Brendan Hall of CHA Consulting. Andy Tyndale will also join us later to help answer your questions. Many of you watching may not be familiar with optimization. So before Brendan does his uh, presentation, I'll, I'll introduce some of the concepts, really just as a, a warm up act for Brendan, and he will be the main presenter today. We expect the webinar to last about an hour, including time for questions at the end. You can submit questions at any time via the chat box in the control panel and also by emailing Design Builder or Brendan afterwards. Brendan's contact details will be on his slides. The webinar is being recorded so you can review it later if you wish uh, and we'll also send you a link to Brendan's presentation slides. Our primary aim today is to give you the inside track from a design engineer's perspective rather than our own on how optimization can be used to give you the confidence that you are actually specifying the optimal energy conservation measures and how this can reduce your design risk and maximize your client's return on investment. Design Builder gives you the ability to undertake all these, what you might call normal forms of building performance modeling and simulation. But today's presentation is going to focus only on design builder tools such as optimization that are relevant to Brendan's presentation. His presentation today is a follow on from our previous webinar where he discussed important design and modeling considerations for ground source heat pump installations. You can still register for that via our website. Today's webinar will extend that earlier discussion to illustrate a process Brendan uses to holistically optimize his design work and a method he's used to ensure that the energy conservation measures selected provided the optimal balance between construction cost and operational energy savings. Many of you watching this may not be familiar with optimization, um, certainly in the context of building performance simulation. So before Brendan wows you with his presentation, I'll just provide you with a little optimization background to set the context. There are often a number of energy conservation measures, measures or ECMs relevant to your project that you could realistically influence. Some, such as the building orientation, may already have been fixed to meet planning authority requirements, permit conditions, etc. Those ECMs that are relevant to your assessment, they might include things like glazing, shading, insulation, lighting, HVAC, etc., are what we'll call your design variables. For each design variable, you have a number of choices on the cost versus energy performance spectrum. These choices might include things like different insulation types and thicknesses, different types of double or triple glazing, different lighting options such as LED and fluorescent, different levels of air tightness, thermal mass, and potentially different HVAC systems. As the optimal HVAC system to meet your project's comfort and energy efficiency requirements will depend to some extent on these and other factors. For example, a radiant system might be well suited to a reasonably airtight, thermally heavyweight building, but not to a leaky building with fast changes in heating and cooling loads. 
the total number of potential design alternatives is the number of choices for each variable raised to the power of the number of variables. So assuming 10 design variables and only three choices for each variable, there are 59,049 potential solutions. If you increase the number of choices to 10, there are total possible 10 billion design alternatives. Even if you ran those in parallel batches on the cloud, that would take a very long time, as you can see here. Clearly, it's not possible to simulate that many design options. So to overcome this problem, general industry practice is to simplify things to make them manageable. With normal project, or well, within normal project budget and time constraints. Often rules of thumb might be used or experience based on what seems to have worked best in the past. But by operating that way, you're forced to accept that the best you can do is to get it about right. But how far optimal is about right and what are the implications for you your firm and your client if about right is quite away from optimal how far you are from optimal really depends on the sensitivity of your particular building to the design variables and the choices available to you in that particular project and also the modeling processes that you use a building is effectively an ecosystem of interconnected variables. And when you change one key design variable, it's highly likely to change the optimal condition for many or all of the other key variables. For example, changing the window sizes changes the solar gain and light transmission. And that could well change the optimal solution for the glazing type, shading, insulation, lighting, HVAC systems and controls, etc., etc. To compound that complexity, many of these variables conflict with each other. A good example of that is changing the glazing size or type to reduce lighting energy by improving daylighting but that often increases cooling loads so that overall more energy is consumed, not less. Most people use parametric methods to handle that kind of conflicting design option scenario, but that still only uses a very limited snapshot and is a long way from accounting for the many or for many of the energy interactions in the building. The power of simulation is that you can model all of this but you have to find a way to assess the total impact of all changes to confirm which combination of improvements works best for your particular building. I.e. you have to find a more holistic way of, of assessing the performance of the building as the interconnected ecosystem that it is, rather than as a series of independent energy saving measures, which is quite often the approach. So what we need are tools that help us to identify not just the best individual ECMs, but to identify how the ECMs combine and work together as a complete solution. As you've just seen, it's not possible to do that using the traditional iterative or parametric simulation methods generally used today. This is where optimization comes in. Design builder optimization uses a genetic algorithm to assess combinations of design variables using the survival of the fittest principle of natural evolution. The optimizer assesses batches of simulation results to see which combinations of variables work best 
And what is best is related to the design objectives that you have set for that project. Your objectives might be to minimize construction cost and operational energy cost, for example. The genetic algorithm learns which combinations of variables work best and then applies its own form of artificial intelligence to find the solutions that provide the best results according to your design objectives. You can actually see this evolutionary process happen right in front of your eyes as you watch an optimization progress. I'll run a short speeded up video to show you how the Pareto front develops and how the solutions keep getting closer to optimal as the genetic algorithm learns from previous simulations. In this example, from a small box model, the design objectives are discomfort hours on the y-axis here and operational carbon emissions here on the x-axis. So the individual simulations form a point cloud and each point on the cloud has a unique combination of design variables. The genetic algorithm intelligently selects the strongest solutions. You can see that the solution set, set starts to migrate towards the origin through iteration as solutions get closer to design objectives. And you can see that a denser cloud forms closer to the origin. The Pareto front here at the leading edge of the cloud in red identifies the range of optimal solutions that can't be beaten in terms of the objectives that you've set, which in this case are discomfort and carbon. The Pareto front typically shows diminishing returns at the at either end or the extremes of, of the curve. Solutions offering a more balanced trade-off between objectives is often, or, or they are often, around the middle, closest to the origin. I won't go into any more detail than that now, but at the end of the presentation, I'll point out some free resources on Design Builder's website that you could use to learn more about optimization. Hopefully, that optimization process has uh, whet your appetite. And I'll now transfer over to and introduce Brendan Hall, who will show you how he applied Design Builder's optimization tools to his own work. Just please give me a, a minute to change presenters. Okay, that's great. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce Brendan who is a senior engineer with CHA Consulting in Syracuse, New York. He's a professional engineer with bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering and has 10 years experience with building energy modeling and geothermal system design. Brendan's also an ASHRAE certified building energy modeling professional and a member of ASHRAE Technical Committee 6.8 on geothermal heat pump and energy recovery applications. So over to you, Brendan. All right, <laughs> thanks, Dave. Um, and, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, thanks for the the, the, the background of the optimization. I think that'll really help um, with some of the practical stuff we're going to show here. And we'll, uh, you know, we'll certainly try to get through this in uh, time so you can uh, catch the second half of the villa game. <laughs> um, so as Dave said, we're going to kind of show uh, kind of more of like a practical application um, of how to utilize the optimization. Um, so this is actually based on it's a case study that we put together um, for the ASHRAE Summer Conference last year. Um, so we kind of revisited that and kind of um, added a little more detail in a couple spots. Um, 
we've done kind of manual versions of this before um, and before the, the, the software um, became really available uh, with, with this module. And, and so we are, are really excited and about trying to use this in more projects, but you know, it's, we're, we're definitely trying to get the word out to uh, more the practitioner level. I think in the energy modeling community, I think people are very aware of it, but as far as in the kind of architectural and um, more the project management side, you know, understanding the value of this um, is definitely something that we're trying to get the word out a little bit more. Um, there we go. Um, so real quick, yes, I, so I work for CHA Consulting. Um, we're based out of Albany, New York. Uh, we have about 1,200 uh, 1200 staff uh, spread out about 30 offices. Um, across the U.S., mainly in the New England and Mid-Atlantic states, um, and you know we are uh, a top 50 firm as uh, as of this year, uh, as according to Engineering News and News Record. So that was a nice little uh, um, ranking for us. Uh, we we have a really diversified um, market. Uh, we cover everything from highways and airports to um, you know, your kind of normal MEP to architecture to sports um, and kind of everything in between. Uh, my group focuses, um, I'm in the uh, energy portion where we focus on um, a lot of kind of industrial and commercial energy audits and then uh, kind of design projects that come from those types of projects. So we do a lot of these kind of ECM based projects and then also supporting our other um, there are other parts of the, the business with uh, those types of energy, kind of high performance energy efficiency projects. So I like to always start with kind of the why, like why are you, why why do we care about this? Why are we putting so much effort into this? So this is the this is a, a graph from um, one of the more recent um, IEA reports where you know they're trying to come up with a pathway of how to get get us to emission reduction goals that will allow you know a uh, control of to a certain couple of degrees of climate change so um, the the RTS uh, line up up here is the kind of business as usual scenario and then the this is the two degree scenario down here and then there's a beyond two degrees which is kind of, I believe a one and a half degree goal um, the parts in color that you see, you know, they're kind of breaking out with these different, um, in these different areas, but really what those are, are it's energy efficiency and it's electrification. Because once you have everything in your building electrified, what that allows you to do is you can do the rest of the carbon reduction by changing your grid mix. You know, it's renewables, it's batteries, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of things that go into that. But the, the part that we focus on is that like the energy efficiency electrification, that's that part is on us. That's our job. And um, in the scheme of climate change solutions, those the building the building uh, uh, are, are they're supposed to be the easy ones, or at least the ones that we have solutions for right now. So um, uh, so it is uh, important for us to try to follow through uh, as much as we can to the extent that we can. So when we talk about building electrification. Uh, especially when you narrow it down to the HVC options, you're really looking at two technologies, especially when you get into the lower tonnages. Um, it's a you're looking at air source heat pumps where your your heat source and your heat sink is the air, or ground source heat pumps where your heat sink heat source is the ground. Um, there are obviously trade-offs between those, um, and also there's scale issues. Air source heat pumps are really good fit for smaller installations, residential, like commercial, you know, VRF system, you can kind of get out a little bit more in square footage, but um, you, you start to run into scale problems, even VRF systems, you, they're, they're, they get bigger by just cobbling together more six ton systems. Um, where ground source heat pumps, you know, then you can, if you need to, you can have a big central station chiller that's, uh, or a heat recovery chiller even, that's running off a ground loop that you could then just plug and play into your existing chilled water system or your existing, you know, um, convert to a hot water system to a low temp hot water system. Um, so there's a lot more flexibility, but you know, there's a lot, there's an increased capital cost there and we're all cognizant of that. And so in trying to figure out how to make the more of these projects happen, a lot of, there's a lot of focus on how do we 
how do we optimize the cost of that ground source heat pump? So ASHRAE came out, well, I should say ASHRAE. So there was an advanced energy design guide that came out um, this past year that was a collaboration with ASHRAE, the American Institute of Architects, the Lumining Engineering Society, USGBC, and then the USDOE, where you know they spell out in a lot of detail strategies to hit zero energy, or even if you can't hit zero energy, to get your building down to a very low UI. So if you haven't, it's a free download. Um, if you haven't gone and run through it, um, I would suggest that you do that, just even just to kind of get, give you some good ideas. One of the things that they go into that I really like is, is so much of doing a low UI, high performance or zero energy building, whatever you want to call it, is the process. If your design team is not dedicated to getting to that goal, oftentimes you will fail. You're going to come up to, into a roadblock at some point. And you, you know, they talk about want needing a, a zero energy champion, because if you don't have someone that's gonna help you push through obstacles, you know, oftentimes it's budget. You do additional initial estimate and it's, oh, oh, this high performance system is too expensive. And everyone says, well, you know, there it is, we tried. And, um, you know, we kind of lowered our expectations and we move on from there. Well, what we're trying to show is, you know, using these tools, using these optimization, optimization, using the energy modeling, that you know we can be smart about this and really try to mitigate the perceived cost premium to some of these systems. You know, this is a really nice graphic that I pulled right from that guide where they talk about you know building simulation is has a role in every single part of the design of one of these high performance buildings because you know, as Dave said, when you start getting into the different components, once you if you if you say I put a bunch of money into doing really high performance glazing, well, it's going to have a trickle on effect on a bunch of other things. And so, in order to capture what the magnitude and what those you know first order and second order effects are, you need to have at least some you need some sort of model to to track that. Um, and that gets kind of lost in the process a lot of time. Or you know, it's we we did it, but we did it to check a box because the RFP said we had to. I've seen I've seen it happen. <laughs> so the the building that I'm going to use to kind of talk through this case study is one of the DOE benchmark buildings. Um, it's there's a series of buildings that uh, that are used as model buildings to help evaluate the effectiveness of energy energy codes. So this is the medium office building. It has uh, three floors, it's 50,000 square feet. It's very typical of like kind of uh, 80s, 90s era, even now, um, you kind of medium office park type building um, that, you, that you see, you know, all over the place. Uh, it's simplified zoning, so it's look at a perimeter zone and a core zone per floor, so you end up with 15 zones. They they lock the minimum constructions at 2004, and that's their baseline for when they evaluate new codes. Uh, I place this in the Greater New York City area. So that's zone climate zone 4A. So it's um, still four seasons. You get cold winters and hot summers, but it's not, say, the extreme cold that you might get in like a 5A or a 6A. Um, infiltration set about half an air change, but just for just for the perimeter zones. The baseline systems they use, they use uh, Whopper square foot lighting, uh, three quarters for plug loads. Uh, they use multi-zone rooftop units with DX cooling natural gas heating, and then they zone it with electric reheat boxes, uh, VAV boxes. So the UI comes out to about uh, 51 kBTUs per square foot per year. So on um, the range of uh, building types, it's a little bit on the low end for an office. It's you know basically average. You're not talking about high density uses. So using kind of typical kind of downstate New York Electrical, um, electrical and natural gas rates, um, you're at about $115,000 a year. So if I take this building and I convert it to geothermal, what that looks like is you end up with about 22 five-ton units. Um, I started the assumption that you would just direct vent to the heat pumps. So you'd, each, each heat pump would have a connection to the outside that it's getting outdoor air to, and then um, you would relieve through a gravity vent. Um, that's the quick and dirtiest way to do it. Um, you have a 15 horsepower 
condenser pump. We're doing vertical bores because um, that's the most typical of commercial installations. And by just changing it to geothermal, we've now reduced our UI 27% where we started at 51 and now we're down to 37. So, but doing that increases the first cost by a little over 200 grand. So the payback for just that ECM, it's a little under 12 years. There's a, in the US, there's a federal, uh, there's still a commercial t uh, investment tax credit of 10%. So that knocks it down to nine years. Nine, depending on what your appetite is, nine years is probably still too long for a type of building like this. Um, certainly 12 years is, you know, usually 10 years for existing buildings is kind of the break even point for a lot of ECMs, but that varies from owner to owner. And it's, it's based on where they want to put their investment dollars. Um, I just want to reiterate, um, reiterate that, so EUI is energy utilization index. So in IP, units, it's 1,000 BTUs per square foot per year. Um, in SI, I have seen it uh, as megajoules per meter squared. I've also seen it as kilowatt hours per meter squared. So there's a couple different, basically, or they're trying to, it's a, there's a fairly crude number for gauging how much energy a building uses. It's not perfect. There's a lot of people that have issue with it, but um, it is, a it helps ground you at least on where, <clears throat> where it, how energy efficient the building is. So the way the my kind of quick and dirty cost estimate for this broke down, you know, you can see why people focus in on the geo bore field so much. It's the single most expensive component of the build of the HVAC system. Um, in this one, it's 26%. It's I've seen before, and it's usually 20 to 25%. But you know, don't forget about all the internal piping. That, that is a if you've ever, if you've read a lot of geothermal stuff and you've ever come across Steve Cavanaugh and what he's uh, written about doing affordable ground source heat pumps, this is his hobby horse. He, it's like, don't forget about all the piping. The piping is expensive. So there are th certainly things you can do to make, to bring those costs down also. Um, we're going to focus on the ground heat exchanger because that is, tends to be the largest single cost. So when we're sizing the ground heat exchanger, there's a lot of different variables. So kind of the major things that we're looking at are, are the balance of our annual heating cooling loads, the peak heating and cooling loads, the spacing of the bores, the conductivity of the grout, which is the backfill of the, of the holes when, when they're being drilled, the kind of steady state ground temperature, and then also like the approach temperatures, which is the affected by what your design conditions of your heat pumps are. A um, couple reasons why, a couple of things that, you, that are good to point out are, so when you look at the <clears throat> annual heating and cooling loads, we, what can happen is if you have unbalanced loads, the, or if the field is undersized, you can have a gradual heating of the field year over year. And so when you start talking about 10, 15, 20, 30 years, you can get into trouble where now all of a sudden the ability of your loop field to provide your equipment with condenser water that it can actually use is it can be limited. So you start losing capacity, you might tr you even just start tripping equipment and it just might not run. Um, but it, it causes a lot of problems and it's hard once it gets to that point, it's difficult to undo that without a lot of expensive fixes. So you know, we talk about annual heating and cooling loads. It's a little bit of a proxy. Really, we are talking about heat from the condenser loop going in and out of the, the ground heat source, the ground field. So where the compressor heat goes in that makes a big difference in what that balance is. So for here, we show kind of equal heating load, equal annual cooling load, because in heating, that compressor energy is going to stay with us in the building. I need less from our ground field. But in the summertime, that is going to get rejected to the ground field. You know, the, For the same heating and cooling loads, I'm going to have 83% more heat rejected than I'm going to absorb. So it's just kind of a good thing to keep in mind that just because it's balanced heating and cooling doesn't mean what's going out to the field is balanced. Um, the other thing is the approach temperature. And for example, I'm going to use the temperatures that I have for this example. So um, like that greater New York City area, 
it's the ground temperature is 52 degrees. And so when you look at the two characteristic equations for how you calculate the length that is required for your heat exchanger, for because the approach is so much larger in cooling than it is in heating, what you see is that you, for kind of the same quote unquote load, because of that approach temperature, you need a lot more heat. You need a lot more um, heating length than you do cooling length. So, going back to our building, so this is what the this is what the ground um, heat exchanger loads look like. This is the direct condenser loads. Um, so you'll see, you know, obviously in the winter time we're heating, we're kind of switching over. We have kind of like a shoulder season here, and then we go into and then we go into summer, and then we're back into shoulder season here and then we're back into winter time and so you know certainly there is a lot more heat here than go, um, going coming uh, going to the ground field than there is coming out of here so you know you would tend to call that cooling dominant um, <clears throat> scenario so we're for all these scenarios we're going to kind of keep the geometry of the bore field constant um, we're going to use um, six inch bores. I'm going to use an eight by six layout. I'm going to keep them 20 foot on center. I'm, what I'm going to let vary as we kind of play with these different ECMs is the design length. And then that'll give you, and that shows up also as the total length of the heat exchanger. So when I did like the, when I did the initial sizing without, you know, with just the base case, this actually somewhat unique scenario um, because you have it's a cooling dominant so i mean we're rejecting more heat than we are to um, then we're then we're absorbing back from the the ground the ground but because of that approach my length that i need to do my heating it's actually longer than i need to do my cooling so the heating even though i'm cooling dominant the heating is actually my limiting case so in an ideal sense, I would want both of these to be even. So you know that we're, we're the ground field at that point is optimized. We can't really get any lower as far as the amount of length. Length means dollars. So we want to try to see as you know we want to try to balance it out because any excess length is basically piping that we're buying only for heating that's not going to help us all on cooling. So in this scenario, um, we have almost 5,500 feet of what I would call excess length um, that's available to for us to optimize, and that would put that at about 80 to 100 thousand dollars, depending on what what the pricing you get. So here's the design cooling load broke up into components. So we're going to kind of look at what targets we should have for our for our ECMs. So you know, the two largest you know, lighting and the solar gain through the windows, those are the two largest ones. So we'll definitely look at those. These, the glazing walls and roofs kind of get lumped into a general envelope. Um, together, they make a pretty good chunk, but each individually don't, um, are not as impactful as that lighting in the, in the, uh, in the solar gain. On the heating side, the ventilation is always a big component, especially when you talk about heat recovery. The, the heat recovery um, that is really effective at knocking that down. Um, glazing is the next biggest. We don't have a ton of glass in this building. It's only 33%, but it's still, you know, it's not wall. So it um, it's very impactful to try to do something like glazing. And then we have the rest of our envelope, which is kind of less impactful, but is still worth looking at because that's an easy thing to, uh, to implement. Um, the other thing that in a normal case, I would look at is the infiltration and tightening up the building. However, trying to get a dollar cost around what it would be to do that is a, was a little difficult. So I am going to leave that one off for this. For this, but I, that would definitely be one to look at is to is that you know improving that infiltration and doing blower door tests and and then that kind of um, commissioning to really try to bring down the amount of infiltration because it, it, it does end up being a big heating load. So the ECMs that uh, that we're going to evaluate in this first round are reducing the lighting to it, like a very efficient LED lighting, four watts per square foot. ECM two, improving the envelope. ECM three, 
uh, really good at glazing. And then four or five are HVAC ECMs. We're going to look at uh, an energy recovery unit with heat recovery, and where we're going to have a heat pump that's going to precondition the air before it gets to all the spaces. Then we'll look at just an ERV, so basically just a box with a filter and a wheel and a fan. Um, so we're not going to precondition it, um, and we're, but we're going to send that to VAV boxes that are going to be able to do demand control ventilation. And then lastly, we're we'll do some exterior window shading to knock down that solar load and see what that looks like. So if you look at our baseline, we have our, we have our, our fairly even, fairly even load on our baseline. Um, the couple that I want to highlight um, <clears throat> are the lighting and then we'll and also um, our, our heat recovery scenario and actually actually I'll show you the um, the bore field results and then we'll put look at them together so we went ran we went ran the loads for each one of these scenarios when it sized it and this is a manual thing at this point is the is the actual bore field sizing and came up with a length that worked for for each one of those ECM scenarios um, so I want to highlight a couple of things. So ECM one, which is lighting. So lower lighting, lower cooling load, heating load stays roughly the same. But now my bore field size has actually gone up because of the, the balance has changed. Um, <clears throat> whereas we have high finish the envelope where the heating has gone very has gone considerably down, you know, because we've really insulated uh, build the building. But because we're also holding in that heat, now my cooling load has gone up, so it's more sensitive to heat. So it goes down a little bit, but it doesn't go down as much as you would probably think. When we look at our heat recovery, the heat recovery also really knocked down that heating load, but it didn't it didn't increase the cooling load by as much. So you can see where it had a much greater effect on what that length of the bore field that we needed was because we're because we're our my limiting case is heating we're more anything we do for heating is going to bring it back into balance but if we if we offset it if we offset the cooling too much then you know the amount the amount of length that the cooling is going to need is going to creep up too so it's it's a it's a balancing game and that's what makes it so hard to kind of automate that part of the process because it is it's a balance and there's a lot of variables involved um, looking at each ECM individually. So we started with our baseline. Um, EUI was around 42. <clears throat> so then um, each ECM you know, has a pretty good payback. You know, LED lighting was probably the worst. Um, but this is also what I'm, I'm including. So there's the cost, but I'm also including. So like the lighting, say, would normally have, you call it like about a two year payback. but because we need more ground and heat exchanger. Now I'm the payback is more like three and a half years where you have something like ECM four or five down here where the amount that we're able to reduce the bore field, the money we save by that is able to almost offset, if not completely offset, the cost of the additional equipment. I will, for the rest of this, put the giant caveat that construction costs are extremely variable. And so are utility rates, and so and they vary by region, they vary by time. So I want to focus. I'm going to focus a lot on the pro. There are numbers to this. But I want to focus on the process because the the numbers are going to vary widely depending on where you're doing it, when you're doing it, and um, kind of the market conditions at the time. <clears throat> so to take this a step further and start getting the optimization, um, we defined five variables. Uh, we had kind of like a good, better, best for each one. So lighting, uh, wall insulation, roof insulation, glazing, and ventilation. Um, we went through and kind of did research kind of cost estimates for what the delta for each one of those is between kind of your your base and um, what the different ECM improvements would be. Um, so we could put some numbers to those and then um, to kind of run our, <clears throat> our optimization. So a couple of things with the setting up 
the observation and design builder was, you know, you got to make sure, obviously, you go through and enable costing um, with, with your model. And so then you go into each um, component. And at the far right, there's always a tab that says cost. And you go through, and that's where you set um, you set your your cost estimate that you determined. Um, there are default numbers in there, um, but like I said, the prices, you know, everyone's aware that construction prices can be all over the place. So um, it's always good that, you know, the better that info is, the better the output is going to be. One thing with using HVAC options, um, so you can set up the options in a detailed HVAC um, template. Go through, um, this is where I think doing more minor tweaks you're going to be better off just because you're changing less variables in the HVAC system. Um, so that's why, you know, like I'm mine, I focus on just what was providing ventilation. Um, it gets a little easier to get a good number for what that costs, and it's also easier to kind of set up. But um, you can set up the detail HVAC template, and then you can save it to the library, and then from there, you can use it as a uh, variable. But the detail HVAC does not have a cost assigned to it. What does have a de what does have a cost assigned to it is the they all have an associated simple HVAC system, and so you have to create kind of a, a partner uh, simple HVAC system to go with it. Um, it doesn't really matter what the settings are because they're all going to be overridden because it, the program is going to use all the detailed HVAC settings, but it's going. It is going to use the cost, so that's where you, you can put it in the cost, and it's a dollar per square foot um, costing, and then there's a dollar per um, dollar per kilowatt of of load. So as you know, say you put in a lot of insulation. Now, not only um, you have a different system, but now your um, design load is a lot less. So it can take help. They can try to take that into account a little bit. Um, Try to use naming schemes that are going to make get, finding all the options because they're going to be in with everything else in the library. So um, you help yourself out with that. And then I just use the default optimization options. I, I they 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 worked well. They gave us some good answers. Um, I was happy. I was happy with it. Um, certainly, you could do some sensitivity analysis of like, well, if I do this, then you know it'll um, help steer me to the option maybe a little bit quicker, but um, I, I, I was very pleased in how the, the numbers came out with the default options. Um, so again, I just want to kind of center everyone with um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to we're trying to get rid of this excess length, and we're trying to use those ECMs to to do that. So now that we have everything set up, we go and run our, our optimization. So at first, I looked at um, because the the program, you know. We're not design builder slash like it, design builder slash energy plus does not automatic does not it doesn't it can't calculate the length of the ground heat exchanger for you. And that is still a manual process that you have to do, and there's judgment involved, and there's a lot of variables. So um, I know it's on the list of research things for energy plus to, in the future to add, but um, it's not something. So in order to do this, we have to find some proxies. Because uh, we're trying to reduce that excess heating length, one of the things I looked at was reducing the heating load. And what was the most cost-effective way of uh, reducing that heating load? So I looked at heating load versus the construction cost. Um, so then we had our, our set of optimal solutions here, like right there. And so I have this optimal set. So I was like, all right, well, how do I, you know, what can I do to pick within this set what is going to be the best option? So, you know, he, the heating load is also is, is important to it, but so is also the cooling load. So I said, okay, so within these options, I'm going to also pick the one that has the lowest cooling load of those options. And so that's this option, uh, this op option here. Um, so we took that as, okay, that's going to be one like, real solid option. So then, um, all right, let's look at this in a slightly different way. So we looked at the annual electric usage. At this point, we're an all electric building. Uh, there's still some, I think we had gas in for, for uh, domestic hot water, but it's a really minor load compared to everything else. So our, 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 our almost all electric building. Um, so what is the lowest 
annual energy usage versus the construction cost. So again, we get our kind of optimal set of solutions here. And then I say, okay, again, we're still trying to reduce that heating load. So what's the what's the option within our optimal solution set that's going to give me the lowest heating load? So that's this this option here. So what does that what do those options represent? So the heating one versus construction cost that was um, doing an ERV that's not preconditioning, but also doing demand control ventilation. So we're both recovering heat and we're reducing the amount of ventilation. So that's, you know, you're getting a good energy savings from that. Um, we had better glass, but not the best glass. Um, we did have very good walls, which I'm sure all the passive house people will love. Um, we had just our code minimum roof and then our, our code minimum lighting. And then the other case where we looked at the energy use, um, same ventilation scheme, um, better, best glass this time. So our triple pane low E, um, very good walls, better roof, but not the best roof. And then kind of the middle of the road lighting, which would kind of represent a high efficiency fluorescent CFL or um, um, option. So I ran both the energy use con construction cost one turned out better. So that's all I'm going to show you. Um, where you can see over here that now in heating, it's saying I need 12,600 feet of bore field and in, for heating. And then in, in cooling, I, I need 12,447. So we've gotten them pretty much the same. That's as close as you're probably really going to get that. And so our design length is now 12,600. Remember, for our, our, we started from about 19,000. So not only have we captured all that excess, but we've actually lowered the cooling a little bit also, just because we've made the whole building much more efficient. Um, and also, because we've done that, um, from a construction cost standpoint, um, our initial um, our initial HVAC scheme needed 22 five-ton heat pumps. A lot of that was... Is, well, it was more for to meet the heating load actually than the cooling load. Um, the new scheme, because of the way the loads are, we need um, 15 heat pumps. So there's seven fewer heat pumps we have now and the, now have to buy install and and all the you know the ductwork everything goes along with that. So um, so with all those ECMs. Minus the the savings from the five uh, the, the the seven fewer heat pumps, um, we estimated that we were adding about one hundred forty three thousand dollars in construction costs because we reduced the bore field so much that offset about one hundred three thousand dollars of that. And because everything's much more efficient now, we have considerable energy saving. Our EUI is down to about twenty nine which you start to get into, you know, maybe I could get enough PV to make that a net zero building, or maybe I could just have a really high performing building. Um, the payback on this package of ECMs is 0.83 um, when compared to our base case geothermal system. And then when I package everything together, what we've done is we've packaged together ECMs with our ground force heat pump. And we've made the payback of all of those, we've brought it down from the original 11.6 years for just a ground source heat pump uh, ECM. As a package, it's now down to 5.2 years, um, which is going to be much more palatable to um, to everyone. Um, because uh, you know that $50,000 a year that you're saving, um, is going to be something that you're going to have in perpetuity. It's it's just you know operating costs are something that um, are going to you're going to have every year. And then again, if you, with the in the U.S. we have a 10% in, uh, investment tax credit, so that brings it down to four and a half years, which makes it even more um, <clears throat> even even more attractive. So you know, that's really showing the strength of being able to play all these things against each other. Um, you know, you could even, you know, I, I limited it to five variables and three options, but certainly you could do even more things and really be able to play things off each other and be able to, you know, find that optimal solution. You know, that's the point of it. Um, and, but, the, you know, I'm hopefully through this exercise, you know, and putting some cost estimates to it and some, uh, that you can kind of show that, you know, the, 
or something that you would never consider, you know, a, a medium-sized office building in a um, medium-sized office building in a um, in a commercial park somewhere, you would almost never in never would any would almost anyone um, look for a geothermal system. They would say package rooftops call today. But you, you show them this package. It's that not only have you got a geothermal system now, but you have really good walls and uh, really good glass, and you know we have a really uh, top of the line villain. You know you're getting a lot of stuff for just a little bit extra. You know the the extra. Uh, you know you're talking probably an extra. You know at that point like a hundred grand or something like that on like a building that's probably 10 or 11 million dollars. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really just trying to enable these types of projects where people wouldn't even consider it before. So conclusions, um, you know, obviously we want to hammer home that, you know, the heat exchanger sizing, it's based on a variety of different factors. Um, you cannot skip the building modeling. Um, there are still people out there that once in a while will try to get away with doing rule of thumbs. It's a bad idea, just leaving it there. Um, you're just going to be, you're going to get a, you're going to get a uh, way better comfort level and and what you're providing to the owner by doing the simulation. And you're going to, you're going to have so much a wealth of info that you can use in other, in, in other areas um, by doing it. Um, and that using, you know, especially specifically this optimization tool with Design Builder with, you know, all the other advantages and the, the strengths that the, software package has to begin with. Um, you know, the optimization tool is just another thing that really kind of <clears throat> gives you another tool to add value to, you know, either directly to the owner or maybe you're you know, working for another engineer or, you know, being part of that, that design team, you know, when that net zero RFP comes out, you can say, yeah, I can really bring something to the table and help us actually get there um, by being able to run these, uh, run these simulations effectively. So a couple references that will be in the um, in the slides that'll be uh, available for download later. And then uh, there's my contact, if there's any questions. How did I do in time? Ben. Okay, thank you, Brendan. Um, you did great on time, I think. Um, so I'll just wrap up now and we'll we'll open it for, for questions in a few minutes. Um, so thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, I'm pretty sure that everybody watching it would agree that you've provided an awful lot of food for thought there. I, I think I, I really liked how you you managed to optimize and find that balance between the, the heating and cooling loads and that then enabled you to identify the best overall combination of energy conservation measures rather than just doing the normal thing of diving in and picking the what seem to be the, the best ECMs um, based on their individual potential without considering the whole picture. I think you the whole piece demonstrated how important it is to to really intelligently combine those key design variables and and that's the only way really that you're going to get the the optimal or the maximum impact um i guess you've already um or or probably just opened a lot of eyes to the possibilities of using this form of um i guess form of machine learning um and artificial intelligence that that optimization has um, for those that are, uh, are watching, I, I did mention earlier, uh, if you want to find out more about Design Builder, um, there are a number of free resources available. So here is the, uh, the program help page. So if you, uh, if, if you want to search the uh, Design Builder help and just type in optimization, that will take you to all of the various optimization topics um, on our website uh, you can access uh, the these case studies from the home page and you can see already at the, at the top here so I'm, I'm on the international section here um, at the top 
and you can already see a couple of optimization related uh, case studies. And also uh, our page with all of the past webinars, this will, will go onto, onto that page, but there are a number of uh, a number of past webinars also related to optimization. It may be easier actually if I uh, if I just show those on this slide so that you can pick them out nice and easily later on. Okay, so I'll just finish the presentation by reiterating that optimization's use of genetic algorithms makes it possible for you to assess the full range of design options uh, and in a much smaller time frame, really a time frame that's viable for normal projects. That in turn helps you to ensure that your designs are optimal it gives you full confidence in the energy conservation me measures that you recommend. It makes your clients very happy because they appreciate that you've left no stone unturned. And overall, it reduces your design risk. So thanks again to Brendan for his excellent presentation, which we hope you found both interesting and useful.